Hey, thank you for coming by for my midweek Bible study. It is uh, Wednesday, the 27th of December, 2023. And we're going to look at a really, really uh, important passage of Scripture right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. And I could just call this foundation. We need a foundation for life. Jesus gives it to us here. It's prof profound. Let me tell you, kind of a, a story. I, first of all, I want to, this is this is Christian Ministry Central. I do a sermon on Monday, a sermon on Friday, midweek Bible study. Every day I do my devotional Bible reading with you on, on the channel so you can go along with it, get full counsel of God. I do probably five short video Bible thoughts. And if you put a prayer request in the comments, I'll pick it up and put out a prayer video, get hundreds of people praying for you. Christian Ministry Central, that's what I call this, creating ministry for Christ, which is where my heart is and always has been. Let's take a minute and pray, ask God to speak to us through this passage. Father, I, I pray that you'd really impact our lives by the truth we find in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, and change us, Father, make us different because we heard from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I'm from Arizona originally. I live, I, I live in Porterville, California right now. I was raised in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I spent a lot of time around Sedona as a teen. Um, what that means is, you know, I'd go down to a place called Oak Creek and drink beer and splash tourists and cause trouble as a young, young guy, which is a long time ago, and I haven't done anything stupid like that since I quit drinking which was 1972, haven't had a drop since, walked with the Lord, different guy than I was then. But in those days, we go down, spend a lot of time in the, the, the Red Rock country around Oak Creek and just uh, toward Flagstaff from Sedona, sometimes on the other, other side of Sedona. Uh, and there's all these beautiful country, Red Rocks around Sedona, but not far from Sedona, on the other side of Sedona from Flagstaff, is a, a church built, a church building built into the Red Rocks. It's it's called the Church of the Red Rocks. It's literally built in the rocks and it's been there for a long, long time. Beautiful place. You can see it way off in the distance. It being founded on the rocks is not going anywhere. You know, it's nothing moves that thing. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. The opposite of the Church of the Red Rocks would be a bunch of homes built in the Phoenix area, okay? Now, I've lived in Phoenix for probably about 16 years of my life in that area, most of that in the, from 2005 to 2018, selling Fords at Sanderson Ford in Glendale, Arizona. So I'm very familiar with the Phoenix area. But the a lot of Phoenix, Phoenix, in fact, is built in, in the... Uh, on the bottom of, of a uh, valley that was dug out over centuries by a river called the Salt River. People don't think of the Salt River as a river anymore because it's a dry river bottom most of the time. For close to 100 years, it's usually dry uh, because the riverbed is, it's been made dry because they made dams upstream in the Salt River. And they dammed up all the water up there in, in, in lakes. And so there's usually no water running in the Salt River, but it's still a river, okay? 1978-79, That's this goes back a long time ago, I pastored a little church in Globe, Arizona. It's up just in the foothills into the, uh, into the White Mountains of Arizona. And we had huge rainstorms in those days. And the lakes above Phoenix, they all had to release their water and they just had to turn it loose at historic rates. And so the Salt River was suddenly a raging river again. And I mean a raging river. That's what it is. It's a dry riverbed because of the lakes up there. But when they turn the, the water loose, it's a river again, okay? It flooded the valley, Phoenix. A lot, of, a lot of places were totally flooded. Hundreds of homes swept away in the water because they're built in the river bottom on sand, okay? They were built on sand, and they were washed away, destroyed. What about the Church of the Red Rocks in those days? Totally unaffected, not touched by that stuff. Nothing happened to the Church of the Red Rocks. We have two pictures of our lives illustrated by the Red Rocks Church 
and the houses on sand in the Salt River bottom, okay? They're illustrations of our lives spiritually and really in real life, okay? Look at Matthew 7, 24 and 25, and I call this the wise builder. Matthew 7, 24 and 25, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Built on rock. Nothing happens when the storm comes. These are the words of Jesus. And it really talks, he makes two, two points. I was thinking about this, um, and I looked some stuff up. It has to do with, with putting into practice the words of Jesus, okay? 63% of Americans describe themselves as Christians, which that's saying it. That's different than living it. 11% of adults say they read the Bible every day. 11% of the, of the country say they read the Bible every day. That actually sounds pretty good to me. I like that. That's how I live. 56% of Americans say they want to read the Bible. They would like, that's something that they would like to do. Now, people are unlikely to hear the words of Jesus without reading the Bible and understanding what it says. That's how you, that's how you hear the words of Jesus. Now, here's a question. How many people would you think that actually read the Bible and hear the words of Jesus, how many of those people do you think actually put the words of Jesus into practice? They, how many of those folks do you think live them out? Good question. If 11% read the Bible every day, maybe half of those people are actually living out the words of Jesus, which makes us a sub-Christian culture, doesn't it? I mean, not a whole lot of people live in that way. Okay, here's another question. What words of Jesus is he... Is he telling us to put into practice? What do you think he's talking about? Well, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says these words. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He's talking about the words he just spoke, the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, this is not stuff we just need to listen to and go, wow, that's cool. That's the Sermon on the Mount. This is stuff we need to live, put into practice, practice these these things, not just not just listen to them. So it I think he's talking about literally saying, you know, you gotta live this stuff I just gave you in the Sermon on the Mount. And um and that's that's a tall order. It's that's a a tough thing to do sometimes, but with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can, we can do that. So second B, we are called to put Jesus' words into practice. That's what he's calling us to. He's saying, you ought to live like I just taught you in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you can't put them into practice without learning them, okay? So you first have to hear them and you have to learn them. How many out of the 11% read and hear and practice Jesus' word? Good question, good question. Uh, Matthew 7, 21 and 23, just before he says these things, says, not everyone who says to me, this is powerful. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say of me, many will say to me on that day, oh, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus could be very direct, and he was being very direct then. It applies to us today. Who enters the kingdom of heaven in those verses? The people who do the Father's will, who put Jesus' words into practice. Those are the folks who enter the kingdom of heaven. They're the people who practice the words of Jesus, who live the words of Jesus, kind of trims down the group of folks that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And look at 22 and 23 again. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, and he calls them evil doers. Whoa, 
That's tough. He's being tough on people. You know why? Because he's telling the truth in terms of God's will. So here's a question I have. Can you prophesy, drive out demons, and do miracles and not put Jesus' words into practice? Think about that. That's what he just said. So can you prophesy, drive out demons, do miracles, and not put Jesus' words into practice? Yeah, you could do all kinds of phenomenal, attention-drawing, miraculous things, but not put the words of Jesus into practice. That's what he's saying. So what does putting Jesus' words into practice mean? What are we talking about? See, there's a big difference between saying things to Jesus and doing what he says. There's a big difference between doing things that draw attention to yourself and being obedient to Jesus, which draws attention to Jesus. And there's a lot of a lot of things going on in the Christian world today that call attention to the person doing them, not necessarily to Jesus. And if we do, if we get the biblical thing straight, the things we do will call attention to Jesus, not us. The, and we will obey the words of Jesus. And it doesn't mean that you run around, you know, doing prophetic things necessarily. It doesn't mean that you're driving out demons and doing phenomenal things. It means that you're obeying the words of Jesus and doing what the Bible teaches. It's a lot different thing than sometimes people think, and they get way off. And here, here's the critical thing. If it calls attention to Jesus, it's obeying his words. If it calls attention to you, you may be way off base. That happens. Look, there's this starts way back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel. Chapter 33, verses 31 and 32. Listen to these words. Ezekiel 31, 33, verses 31 and 32. Many, uh, my people come to you as they usually do, and they sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths, they express devotion. But with their heart, but their hearts are greedy and just unjust for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. Whoa! That's kind of a powerful, a powerful phrase there. So what was the problem with Ezekiel's audience? Well, they listened, okay? And they mouthed devotion. And but they were greedy for for personal gain. They were they were wrapped up in sin. God to them was nothing more than one who sings beautiful songs. And they listen and go, Hallelujah. It's easy to do that. What could this resemble? In a lot of ways, it could resemble the whole kind of going to church thing. Raise my hands, holler hallelujah. Listen to wonderful songs. Affirm, yeah, I love God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow Him. But do I do it? Do I do the things of God? Listening and mouthing devotion. Here's, here's what I'm thinking. Maybe real worship starts after church. Okay. Maybe real worship starts when we leave the church building and walk out in, walk out into the world. I was thinking about James one twenty six and twenty seven. Listen to these words. This is really where, where you know what, what here, here's what I keep thinking. It's about how we treat people, how we interact with people, how we treat God's main creation, other folks. Listen to, let me find it again in my notes. James 1, 26 and 27. If anyone considers himself religious, yet does not keep a tight type, type ring on his tongue, and he deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. How do you speak to others, you know? Whoa, that's a big deal. How do you talk to other people? All of us blow that at some point. Then he says this in verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after or orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being, being polluted by the world. It, it's... Do you treat people like God would treat them when they're in a tough spot? How do you treat people? Do you treat people with the devotion of God? 
that's putting the words of Jesus into practice. You know, I, uh, I sell funeral and cremation insurance out of a funeral home in Porterville, California. And I do funerals and I help people uh, talk with people when they lose someone and, and offer to help people, that kind of thing. What, what, we, what we try to do is serve people. And I try to serve people in the name of Christ when they lose someone. We'll help them with it, with whatever comes up. A lot of things are going to always have to do with social security and insurance, those kind of things. And so we try to help people with that kind of stuff. Just be that, that we don't make any money off of that. It could lead to helping them with pre-needs at some point, And that's actually where I make money when I sell them an insurance policy to take care of their services when they pass. But we just want to help people. And that's how, that's where my heart is. I like that. I love that. I had a lady who lost her husband and, um, and I had was working with them to put their pre-needs together. And before they got it done, her husband passed away and uh, she was concerned about social security. The way social security works is if you're married and let's say you're a husband and wife and the husband dies and then the wife loses her social security, but she, she would get either hers or his, wh whichever would pay more. And in this case, the husband's paid her, paid more. It's almost always how it is. So you have to go down to social security and with a death certificate and work all that stuff out. You know what I did? I went down there with her and helped her work it out. It's, it's about taking care of people. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, what do we do to take care of people? Are we willing to get involved with people and help them? And, uh, what happens is uh, I end up doing funerals for people. I've been doing funerals for a little over 48 years. And I want to try to get involved in the, with the people when I do that and help them. Treat them like Jesus would treat them. I try to get to know, you know, this is almost always someone that I didn't know passed away. I try to learn about them, learn about their family so that I can help these folks celebrate their life and uh, make make it personal for them and bring, bring grace and healing to them in a time of loss. So that, that's how I try to respond to it. I think that's the idea. It's about how we treat people. Look at Matthew 7, 24 through 27 again. I wanna just read the whole, the whole thing, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Start working, living the words of Jesus. And when the heat gets turned up in life, when the rainstorms come, you won't get blown away, okay? Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And, uh, you know, those are the, the houses in the river bottom in the Phoenix area. They all got washed away. That's a picture of the guy who, does, who just listens to the words of Jesus, maybe, or doesn't even pay attention to him at all. And then the, 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 uh, the tough times come in life, and it's just his house gets washed away. He doesn't make it through the tough times. I think these words of mine probably refer directly to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, which means what we need to be living out, fleshing out in our lives the stuff he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. We need, in fact, I probably ought to take a, do a series of sermons through. I've done that several times in my life through the Sermon on the Mount. Very important, man. Jesus is talking. And I'll tell you what, if Jesus is talking, everybody needs to listen to Jesus. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. All I have to do is land on it here. Okay. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow. How do you do that? Okay. Easy to love. It's easy to love your friends. They love you back, right? But do you, do you think Jesus really expects us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? He, he does, otherwise he wouldn't have said that. He told us that's how he wants, wants us to do things. So this is what I do when someone really wounds me, and I've been wounded, okay? 
and I still get wounded from time to time. Someone does something really bad to me. You know what I do? I put them on my prayer list and I pray for them. And I pray for them until I get the sense that, it, that God is telling me it's time not to pray for them. Someone really hurt me a couple of years ago. Bad, okay? Cost me a bunch of money. You know what I did? I put him on my prayer list and I prayed for it. And I prayed that God would bless his life and that God would teach him how to, how to treat people and prayed for prayed that I would not hold anything against him, but prayed for him. That's, Jesus means that. He means for us to treat it. Someone really hurts you, pray for him. You forgive him. You don't want him. If you don't forgive him, then they're in charge of your life. You can't let that happen. You want Jesus to be in charge of your life. And the way you keep him in charge of your life is uh, in charge of your life is forgiving other people that hammer you and hurt you. Okay? That's how you live. Otherwise, your house is built on sand, and when the river comes through, it's going to wash it away. But if you can uh, treat people with respect, even when they hurt you, and pray for them, okay? Pray for them. Wish well to them. Wish them well. You, you, you're doing the right thing. Look at verse, Matthew 7, verse 25. Matthew, Matthew 7, verse 25. Look at I get confused sometimes. Why is this? Probably because I'm old. That's what I'm thinking. The rain, Matthew 7, 25. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not, it did not fall because it was, it was, it had its foundation on the rock. It's a metaphor. He's, you know what he's talking? He's not talking about houses and creek bottoms, river bottoms. He's talking about your life in tough times. He's saying, if you live the words of Jesus, when the heat gets turned up in your life, you're not going to, you're not going to get washed away. You're not going to get tilted over. You're not going to get hurt. You get hurt, but you're not going to be destroyed. Okay. If, listen, if you live long enough, you're going to have tough times. I've been through a bunch of tough times, but I've never been washed away by the tough times. The river's a metaphor for the tough times. They've never washed me away. In fact, they usually make me stronger. Are they fun? No. There's a bunch of stuff in life that's not fun. But when you begin to live the words of Jesus, you're going to stand in the storm. And that's what life is really about. So look at James 1, 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25. Listen to this. Do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You know what? If you just, oh, that was a good sermon. But did you do, did you do what it says? I, I uh, went to a conference once where a guy who wrote a book called Disciple. His name is Juan Carlos Ortiz. I'll always remember this guy. This is probably 40 years ago. I went to a conference where he spoke. He's pretty well known and uh, wrote some other books too. But he had been a pastor in, I think it was in somewhere down in South America. Um, and he went in and preached a sermon one week. And he came back the next week, preached a sermon again. Same sermon. Then he came back the third week and preached the same sermon. People go, Pastor, why are you preaching the same sermon? You're not doing it yet. He said, you're not obeying it. You're supposed to obey the words of Jesus. Powerful. Okay. They were just listening to the word. And you know what James says? If you just listen to the word, you're deceiving yourselves. You're deceiving yourselves. And then he says, do what it says. Obey it. Verse 23, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. In other words, you're doing, you're just listening to stuff and it makes no difference, made no change. Maybe you look in the mirror to, to see, to, uh, to comb your hair, but you didn't comb it. You just saw yourself and walked away. It's nothingness, uselessness, okay? The man who looks intently into the perfect, uh, and look at, okay, the man, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it. He'll be blessed in all he does. Why do I read the Bible every day? Because I want to know what it says so I can do what it says. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. But it does mean 
that I'm going to build my house, my life, on the words of Jesus by living obediently to them. And I'm not perfect. You never will be, okay? Perfect in the eyes of God because I'm washed clean by the blood of Jesus. But I want to live my life obediently to Jesus and build my life on obedience to him. And then I won't get washed away when the storm comes up. And, I, and I, 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 it will be the picture of the church of the Red Rocks. Doesn't get washed away. Not the houses in the river bottom in Phoenix when, it, when the floods come. And they still come. And they still build houses in the river bottom. I know. You know what the Indians did who lived in that part of the world? When, you know, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, they built up on in the mesas so they wouldn't get washed away when the, when the, when the rains came. They're smarter than we are. It's always amazing to me. Okay, Matthew 7, 26 and 27 again. But everyone who, bear, who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. The guy who hears but does not practice Jesus' words gets wrecked. He can get wrecked. The listener versus the practitioner, okay? We need to go way beyond just listening to the words of Jesus. We need to be practitioners of the words of Jesus, and then we will not crash in the storm. The listener crashes in the storm. And look at Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Some more of the stuff on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Listen to this. Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with him and with, with her in his heart. Okay? The guy who practices Jesus' word does not commit adultery. He, whether it's physical, you know, goes out and commits it physically or in his heart. In other words, he doesn't lust after other women. And you know what? How do you get to that point? The Lord delivers you from that. The Lord delivers you. When you walk with Jesus, the Lord will deliver you from that. He'll give you victory over that stuff. So how does the obedience of not committing adultery keep you from getting washed away in life's storms? Some people would say that, wow, you just miss out on a bunch of exciting sex. That's not absolute nonsense, okay? Here's, here's how this works. You know, marital difficulties, you married for a long time, you may run into marital difficulties. We've been married a little over 50 years. You can, any suggestion that long-term marriages are simple is utter nonsense, okay? You have to work through stuff. So you could respond by being faithful to your wife, or you could respond with adultery. So if you're faithful to your wife, you're going to weather the storm. If you are adulterous, you could crash and burn, okay? That's, that's the point of all this. If you, if you give in and don't live the words of Jesus by being faithful, if you, if you give in to the sin, it'll wreck things. And it, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about their marriages over the 30 years that I was involved in full-time ministry. And I've seen a lot of divorces, sadly. And I tell you the truth, I've never seen a divorce where adultery wasn't involved, okay? It's all, it always has something, someone was cheating. That's always how it works. And the marriage got destroyed. But if you don't do that, you're going to be living the words of Jesus and you'll weather the storm. That's a good thing, okay? I want to tell you about my dad. Uh, my dad, um, good, godly man, he worked in Vietnam from 1966 to 1970 as a civilian for a company, okay? And uh, he told the story of the first night he arrived in Saigon. And he lived in a, in a hotel in Saigon. His company provided him a room in a hotel in Saigon. That's where he lived. If most, he moved around a little bit, but most of the time he always kind of came back and lived in that hotel. And the very first night in that hotel, uh, he got up to his room. There was a prostitute in the room. And she explained, oh, they, I come with the room. You know, this is part of the service. A prostitute is provided in the room. He said, I don't want a prostitute. I'm a married man. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. Never have, never will. He 
took her by the hand, took her down to the desk, and he said, never send a prostitute to my room again. And they didn't. And they respected what he said, okay? Now, you think, well, that sounds like a good story. Once you, you every once a year, he'd go home for a month, okay? And spend a month in Flagstaff with my mom. And later on, they were actually in Phoenix, but started off in Flagstaff. But, and you think, you know, that sounds like a good story. But you know what my dad did in 1969? I'm in the army, okay? And I'm stationed in Germany. <clears throat> and uh, Vietnam's raging still. And I get a note for a letter from my mom. She goes, I'm going to spend a month with your dad in Vietnam. And we're going to travel around to some other places. And they were pretty safe, actually, in Saigon. But I uh, went down to the Bonhof. That's the train station. That's the only place you could make a transcontinental call in those days. And I called my mom. And I said, Mom, anybody share with you that there's a war going on in Vietnam? What are you doing going to Saigon? She goes, oh, no, we'll be fine. I'm going to spend a month with your dad over there. And she did. Okay. You know where she, two two weeks of that month they spent in Saigon, and they spent them in the hotel where my dad stayed. He just she just joined him in his hotel, the same place where the where he was offered the prostitute, and he'd become friends with all the prostitutes and all the people who worked there. You know what happened during those two weeks? My mom met the, those people, and she became friends with them, and they knew that my mom and my dad loved them in spite of their occupation, and that my dad would never in involve himself in that. Now, for, for four years, they lived apart, except for the month my dad was at home. Do you think they had some tough times in their marriage during those four years? Of course they did. But nobody committed adultery, and their marriage survived. My dad died just before his 70th birthday, 10 days before his 70th birthday. They'd been married 49 years at that point. And their marriage survived. They loved each other. They were always happy. And so right in the midst of difficult times, he did not commit adultery. He lived the words of Jesus and survived lots and lots of storms. Never got washed away. That's how it works. That's how we need to live. Hope you'll hang on to that. Let's pray. Father, help us learn to live the words of Jesus and then stand in the storm with his power because we lived the words of Jesus and did not get washed away in the storm. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.